Greetings to all of you. As director for the Center of International Law at the National University of Singapore, I am delighted uh, to welcome all of you joining us from different parts of the region, from Singapore, different parts of the world, for a very special uh, conversation we're going to have today with uh, Ambassador Katerina Zelenko, uh, the uh, Ukraine's ambassador to Singapore, and of course, the one and only ambassador and professor Tommy Koh. Today marks the first, well, the anniversary, I hate to even use that term, but basically it was one year ago today that Russia launched its unlawful invasion of Ukraine, a peaceful country. Um, and a lot has happened in that year, but I have to say that what is remarkable is the resilience, the bravery, and the absolute fortitude that Ukraine and its people have shown in resisting the great force, or what we thought was a great force of the Russian military. So in a year, much has happened. The General Assembly has adopted resolutions just recently, uh, yesterday, a resolution um, again, uh, calling for Russia to withdraw from Ukraine, uh, condemning the invasion, um, and, and more. But I think it's important to re remember as well that it was in 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea. And I think we need to keep that in mind. But anyway, we're, today we're going to talk, have a conversation um, with Ambassador Zelenko and Tommy Cole. And let me just give you a little bit of background. Um, ambassador Zelenko is a career diplomat. She was appointed the ambassador extraordinary and plenipotentiary of Ukraine to the Republic of Singapore in 2020. Um, before that, she was the spokesperson of the Ukrainian Foreign Ministry and deputy director of the Communications and Public Diplomacy Department. Um, she has well over four, 20 years of diplomatic experience. Um, she's been posted in Austria, in Germany, also at international organizations in Vienna. Um, and um, so it's a pleasure to have you here with us, uh, Ambassador. And of course, Tommy Ko. <laughs> and I know that um, Professor Weiler always says if there's one person that really doesn't need an introduction, he's absolutely right, it's Tommy Ko. Uh, but we have just again, very briefly, um, he's professor of law at NUS, ambassador at large at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Just he's right. on many, many uh, advisory uh, boards, including, for me importantly, he's chair of the International Advisory Panel of the Center for International Law. Um, he was president of the uh, UN uh, Convention for the Law of the Sea Conference. Um, and also he was chair of the preparatory committee for the Rio conference, but a great relevance today, and maybe this is something that not many of many may be aware of. Um, he also served as the UN Secretary General Special Envoy, and this was in 1993, to make peace between Russia on the one side and Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Um, so Tomiko has an incredible breadth of experience. Um, uh, he was also ambassador to Washington, D.C. Uh, for Singapore. And for those of us in Singapore, we all know today uh, he has an op-ed, a wonderful op-ed um, in the Straits Times. Um, and I think this is something we're going to be talking about in our conversation, um, basically why Russia should not succeed in this war against Ukraine. All right, I've talked enough. <laughs> I think we should go on uh, with our uh, conversation. Ambassador Zelenko, thank you so much for joining us. I know this is such a difficult time. You were just in Ukraine quite recently, actually. Uh, so I say you're coming from the front lines. You've seen what's going on there. So perhaps we could just give you, you would like to just say a few opening comments. Thank you, Dr. Orl. Thank you, dear Professor Kaur, dear participants, ladies and gentlemen. It's 
my pleasure and honor to share my views with you today. Um, this is an important day for Ukraine, but also a day when we reflect on many things that happened since the 24th of February, 2022, when Russia launched its unjustified, unprovoked and illegal invasion of Ukraine. In fact, we've been at war since 2014, when Russia first occupied Crimea, as you mentioned, Rupert, and then instigated the war in Donbas under the utterly fabricated pretext of uh, protection of the Russian-speaking people in Donbas. And now we see that um, after nine years of um, war, of uh, various attempts to find a common ground, of uh, um, many efforts uh, put in place in order to uh, negotiate a peace and give peace a chance. We all have seen that Russia chose a path of war. It was not our choice. Our choice was to resist and to protect our families and our country. The whole world has seen and now looks with, ad with admiration at the people of Ukraine who have been living quite in a nightmare over the last year, with almost every day missile attacks, um, drone attacks um, against the civilians, against um, our critical infrastructure, which is uh, critical and crucial at the time of uh, cold winter season. But of course, uh, regular attacks in uh, the eastern parts of Ukraine with everyday casualties and human tragedies. It's been a challenging year, but it has also been a year where we realize that there is no other choice than to keep being resilient. Otherwise, too much is at stake. If Russia stops fighting, there will be no war. If Ukraine stops fighting, there will be no Ukraine. Today, our army can be proud of its uh, fantastic achievements on the ground. Our armed forces could liberate more than a half of territory that Russia seized since the 24th of February, 2022. And we keep moving forward. We definitely need tools to finish the job. We need weapons. We need financial support to keep the economy afloat. And we need further strong pressure on Russia. We need to do anything possible to deprive the aggressor country of the revenues and tools needed to maintain and sustain this military machine. Because every cent gained by the Russian Federation means more deaths, more human tragedies, more suffering in Ukraine. We strongly appreciate great support provided by many countries of the world for Ukraine. It has been military support, financial support, supporting the international organization and the yesterday voting in the United Nations General Assembly was a clear example of that. You could clearly see that um, exactly the same number of countries, 141, supported Ukraine. And it's exactly the same number of countries that on the 2nd of March, 2022, when Russia invaded Ukraine, voted in favor of Ukraine, condemning Russia's aggression and Russia's invasion. What does it mean? It means that the support of the world remains unwavering. The world is still behind Ukraine. But it also um, means that there's still a long way to go for us. In order to achieve this goal, we need to see that the support of the countries across the globe remains strong. And of course, we need more because we are still dealing with a, with a regime 
that is obsessed with subjugating the neighboring country, which means that he will not um, waver in putting more and more efforts and power and resource and um, human lives um, to achieve his goals in Ukraine. What can be done? Of course, there are many elements to consider in, in, in what can be done in order to support Ukraine. Um, we definitely need more sanctions. We need more pressure. Uh, Russia has already been uh, um, expelled of 24 international organizations and the representatives of the Russian Federation could not be elected on the positions of chairs and vice chairs to more than uh, 40 international bodies. And I think we need to move forward with that because it is important to maintain the narrative that Russia is nowadays a global pariah, the country that decided to attack another uh, independent and sovereign nation and to change borders by force. This is something that may not be tolerated. Why? Because we live in a globalized world, we live in the world where we cannot call Ukraine as the war that is happening somewhere in, and uh, this is not our war. That's something that I sometimes hear in um, discussions. It is also crucial to understand that we should not split blame for the war between the victim and the aggressor, because this is quite a obvious situation a blatant violation of the international law, of the rules and principles that have been established uh, since the end of the Second World War. In fact, we are dealing with one of the most devastating international armed conflicts uh, since the Second World War, and the response to this magnitude and the scale of aggression has to be appropriate. It must be a global response that will stop the hostilities, give peace a chance in Ukraine. And um, um, the end phase of this cycle, as it always is, is the bringing the perpetrator to account and the international courts. You know that Ukraine has applied for the case at the International Court of Justice after uh, Russia started its full scale invasion of Ukraine. We are also uh, calling our partners uh, across the globe to support the idea of establishing a special tribunal for the crime against aggression, a crime of aggression against Ukraine. Um, as we consider it as the only viable way to achieve accountability and justice. So these are the major elements of um, the whole concept that we present. And of course, I would be more than happy to share my views on further um, aspects and nuances of the peace process in Ukraine. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Ambassador. And I think, um, I think you said it so clearly, um, if Russia stops fighting, there's no war, but if Ukraine stops fighting, there's no Ukraine. Um, and your points made that, and I think this is the risk that this is seen as a regional um, uh, war. Really, it, it, it's something that impacts the whole world because a, a very egregious violation of international law has taken place. Um, so um, in, in, in terms of, you were just um, in uh, Ukraine, um, can you explain the situation there? I mean, people really, uh, a, a year ago, I think the view was that Ukraine, uh, oh, I see, that Ukraine um, uh, wouldn't be able to resist uh, the Russian invasion, but it has done remarkably well. Hold on, I see Tommy is here. <laughs> I thought we lost you, Tommy. <laughs> so I'm glad to see you back. All right. Tommy, you, you, as always, a fantastic op-ed. Um, and it's always so clear to the point and very powerful. 
So if you could just tell us why shouldn't Russia succeed? Uh, uh, if you could just talk a little bit about op-ed and I think it sets a very good context for our conversation. Okay, I want to deal with three questions. The first question is, what led to the war? There are people in Asia who hold the view that Russia was compelled to act because of the eastward expansion of NATO. So they blame NATO for the war. I want to comment on this argument. I want to say that this argument is without merit. I want to say that the, the members, the, the countries that once belonged to the Russian Empire are now independent countries. And as independent countries, they have a right to determine their destiny, including whether to join NATO, whether to join EU or both. The fact that they were once ruled by Russia doesn't mean that they must forevermore be ruled by Russia. So to take the example of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, when these three countries gained their freedom, one of the first things they did was to apply to join the EU for their economic well-being and to join NATO for their security. They have every right to do so. So it's not so much the eastward expansion of NATO as that when countries were freed from Russian rule, they sought security and protection. And joining NATO gives them the security and protection. So the, the cause of the war is not NATO. The cause of the war is President Putin. I describe President Putin in my op-ed as an ultra-nationalist leader of Russia. He once said that the dissolution of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical disaster of the 20th century. What he meant was that he regretted the collapse of the Russian Empire. And what he's trying to do is to create a Russian sphere of influence consisting of the neighbors of Russia, as well as the country that used to belong to the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact. When Ukraine refused to abide by his wishes, he resorted to force to impose his will. The so-called special military operation is a semantic trick. The last 12 months, Russia has waged a full-scale war against Ukraine, and a and the war is being conducted with great brutality and in total ignorance of the law governing warfare. So the proper way to view this is that Ukraine is an innocent victim of an aggression by a big neighbor. You know, that's how we should frame it. And the, the fault lies with Russia and in particular President Putin, it does not lie with NATO. Thank you, Tommy. I think that's so important. And we talk about narratives um, and the NATO narrative was from the beginning, other ones as well. Um, this idea that, well, NATO was expanding eastward. I, I take the position sometimes, even if it were, does that justify an invasion of Ukraine? As you recall, Tommy, we had the CIL had a very good um, session with the Turkish ambassador um, right after um, the invasion uh, uh, of Ukraine by Russia last year to address this very issue. But let me ask both of you, because I think this narrative issue has really um, been a factor in what you, we call loosely East-West-North-South relations, particularly, I think, the situation with China and India, but also some of the African states, even in ASEAN, um, the fact that there are so many abstentions when this is clearly an egregious violation of international law, there's just no doubt about that. Um, why do you, is there, can those countries be convinced to think otherwise? What is the issue, do you think? And, and, and Ambassador Zelenko, you're here in Singapore, I think a very strategic place for seeing Asian perspectives. Um, and I know in your, in your op-ed, Tommy, you talked about Singaporean 
um, perspectives as well. I mean, Singapore has made a very strong position um, condemning and standing up for the rule of law. Um, so uh, Ambassador Zelenkov, I could turn to you and your thoughts on this um, in terms of, is there a difference of narrative between the regions? Yeah, making a very good point, Milo, for saying that um, it is not enough for Ukraine to um, get uh, support and to have uh, conquered hearts and minds of people in the Western part of the world. Um, that Western coalition of countries that now support Ukraine, they are doing a tremendous job, but it is also critical for Ukraine to fight for hearts and minds uh, in the countries of the global south, to reach out to different societies. So we also have countries in Central Asia, uh, the post-Soviet republics that still historically have close ties with Russian Federation. Uh, we also know that there are many countries um, um, in Africa and in Latin America that still have um, post-colonial sentiments, and this is something where Russia sometimes misuses its narratives to still remain relevant in this part of the world. It is important for us to come across with a very simple message that we are actually on the same page with the countries in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, if it comes to the rejection of the notion of zones of influence. And that is something that Russia is trying to do in Ukraine. If you look at the history of Russia's imperialism, you will always see that this is a cornerstone of, of the Kremlin's narratives. That's how they work, and there is nothing new that has been invented by the Kremlin since um, the beginning of uh, the war in Ukraine. Now you can clearly see what the Russian propagandists say. They speak about the fight against NATO, about the, the collective West. Naturally, if you want to start a war, you need an enemy. And this artificial uh, seeking an enemy in the Western world, this is something that Russia has been doing since the collapse of the Soviet Union. They have made up an enemy and they are tirelessly fighting against it on the Ukrainian soil. So that's what we uh, really have to, um, to explain and uh, to walk at if we um, uh, address our partners and colleagues in um, um, on other continents of the world. And another thing is the more pragmatic uh, aspect is that we all have seen the heavy implications of Russia's invasion of Ukraine in the world. We see the soaring prices, commodity prices, we see political uncertainty in the countries uh, th that experience food shortage. That means that uh, this is a very destabilizing factor that can drive migration. There are many uh, negative elements of it. The whole world has not yet fully recovered after the consequences of the COVID pandemic. We still have to address these repercussions. And in addition to that, instead of tackling the global issues like sustainable development, we need to tackle the uh, unjustified aggression and invasion of uh, Ukraine by Russia. So this is something that we also have to keep in mind that the sooner Ukraine wins this war, the faster we will be able to establish lasting, just, and comprehensive peace. And that will give us the opportunity to get back to, to the business as usual, to the, those pressing issues that need to be addressed. I think this is something that is kind of common language that does not require translation if you speak to your counterparts in all corners of the world. Thank you. Yes, could not agree with you more. Um, Tommy. Uh, your thoughts on this? Um, of the 10 ASEAN countries, eight countries voted against Russia. Only two countries, Vietnam and Laos, abstained. Vietnam and Laos abstained only because of historical reason. During the Cold War, they were allies, partly because 
Russia is a major provider of arms and ammunition to those two countries. And, and they feel the obligation not to offend Russia. Every country pursues its national interest. So I don't blame Vietnam and Laos for abstaining. I understand why they're doing it, but it doesn't mean that they are right, they are wrong, but I understand why they're doing it in their own national interest. I want to make another point, which is that some leaders have been unhelpful in the way they frame this conflict. Some leaders talk about the conflict as a conflict between Russia and the West. This is wrong. Other leaders say it's a conflict between democracy and autocracy. This is also wrong. The proper way to frame this conflict is that you have a powerful country, Russia, which sent its army across an international boundary into the territory of its neighbor to impose its will on their neighbor. And all of us should condemn this. I was privileged to represent Singapore at the UN. In 1978, we condemned Vietnam for invading Cambodia. In 1979, we condemned the Soviet Union for invading Afghanistan. And in 1983, we condemned the United States of America for invading Grenada. So we have a consistent position. We must respect the independent sovereignty and territorial integrity of every state. And no state, no matter how powerful, has a right to send its armed forces into the territory of neighbor and to replace a government and to impose a government of its choice. That is how we should frame this, you know. It, it's, it's very misleading to, to say it's a conflict between democracy and autocracy. It is not. The conflict is simply the right of Ukraine to exist as an independent sovereign state with its territory protected. That's the issue. And if you frame it that way, then I would say every country in the world has a stake in this fight. Because what the Russians did to them could happen to all of us. And this is why I dismiss the argument which some Singaporeans have made that this is a European war. It's far away. It's got nothing to do with it. And I say to them, you're wrong. It has everything to do with them, just as the American invasion of Grenada has everything to do with them because the Americans violated the UN Charter and international law. It violated the independent sovereignty of Grenada and its territorial integrity. So, so let's frame, it, frame this conflict in a proper way, you know, and not to confuse things as the leaders of America and Europe have tried to do by saying that, oh, it's a conflict between democracy and autocracy. All Democrats must fight for Ukraine. I would say, to my friends in Europe and America, please don't confuse the issue by saying that it's a conflict between democracy and democracy. This conflict is the use of armed force by a powerful country to impose its will on the neighbor. And this must be condemned by all countries. Tommy, um, absolutely. And I know that I, Singapore made very clear this point when it said, we stand for principles, we're not taking sides. And, and that really resonated with me and that really should be the message. Yeah. This is about uh, territorial integrity and sovereignty of states. Yes. Um, it's not a political issue, but it's a very legal issue. Absolutely. And, it's a very and, and we, we prove our allegiance to the charter and principle when we had the courage in 1983 to condemn America. If we didn't have the courage, then people would say, well, you're, you're just an opportunist, you know? We prove our allegiance to the UN Charter and to international law because we had the courage to condemn a country that's important to us and close to us. Yeah, if you allow the crowd also recognize Singapore's position as uh, in order to protect the UN Charter and the principles of the international law, Singapore did not only vote in favor, it also co-sponsored 
the, the draft text of this resolution, because uh, this is something that is quite obvious, and this is quite an example that is really difficult to um, uh, put into question or, or something, just starting doubting about it. Uh, we are really dealing with a blatant violation of the principles of the rules-based order and international law. Interestingly, if you look at the display of yesterday vote, you can see that all Asian countries except North Korea, so not a single country, um, voted in favor of Russia. Not a single one. Yes, we had those uh, fan sitters who abstained, but still, uh, we can clearly see that this position, if it comes to the protection of the uh, territorial integrity and sovereignty of states, resonates with many countries in this part of the world too. This is something that is important. Yeah, uh, I think it is important that um, the vote has been steady, actually. Yes, a couple of changes there. But a year later, I think there was concern, perhaps on Ukraine's part, that there would be fatigue, um, yeah. that the that it would fall off the you know the the media it hasn't been the case mm -hmm. um, uh, but so thinking about that and, and, and Tommy as well as international lawyers and I can ask you as well ambassador um, what's the role for international law here I mean we see the general assembly the resolution being adopted but these are not security council resolutions uh, they're general assembly resolutions um, I know that there's some cases in front of the ICJ. Um, so how, how, how much of a role, how effective can international law be? Um, Ukraine seems to have some faith in it. It is bringing cases to the ICJ. I know it's the there's the possibility of um, perhaps going to the criminal court or having um, a, a separate tribunal. Um, so if I could ask both of you your thoughts on, 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 on this particular aspect of the, um, the war. Tommy? Uh, okay, on the Security Council. The Security Council has an inherent structural defect, which is that the five permanent members each have a veto. So it means that you cannot take any action against any of the permanent members. So in this case, Russia is aggressor, but Russia is protected by veto power. And we bring it to the UN General Assembly. The UN General Assembly is a parliament of the world. And the fact that 141 countries voted for the resolution yesterday that calls for a comprehensive, just and lasting peace in Ukraine based on the principle UN Charter is significant. You know, as you say, 12 months have passed, but the support for Ukraine has not been eroded. I think that's remarkable. And we must congratulate Ambassador Zelenko for that. I want to say that the, the trouble with international law is that it has no enforcement mechanism, you know. So, Ukraine has brought a case against Russia in the International Court of Justice. If the Russian refuse to appear, there's nothing we can do about it. You know. However, in the International Criminal Court, the chief prosecutor has command an investigation to see whether Russia has committed aggression, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. I think that's significant, you know, that's significant. I think that in my view, Russia has committed aggression, war crimes and crimes against humanity, and they must be held accountable. Ambassador Zelenko. Yes, two points. Uh, first, um, all the resolutions that are adopted by the UN General Assembly are a good contribution to the file cases uh, that are being considered in the international courts. Um, the problem with the international justice is that it takes time. In order to come to the final stage of the process, it takes years. 
That is something that we have seen also with other countries where crimes, war crimes were committed. Um, that is going to happen with Ukraine. You remember the MH17 case. Just last year, we finally reached the first decision of the court after eight years of uh, investigation process. The good news is that Russia's invasion of Ukraine is happening at the time of digital technologies. This is quite a digital war too. And it makes it easier for international lawyers, for all those um, legal experts who are now working in the so-called international legal coalition to support Ukraine, it makes easier for them to collect evidence. Many of them can uh, easily travel to the towns like Bucha, Irpin, liberated cities, Izum and Kherson, and to experience up close and see with their own eyes all the atrocities that have been committed by Russia. They can, we can easily find many pictures and the easiest expertise will prove that they are genuine, showing the graveyards in, in the villages and small towns that have been left by the Russian army. That means that it will be already easier compared to the previous wars to collect the whole package of uh, cases and proofs that show that what Russia is doing in Ukraine is um, how the professor made it very clear. Um, crimes of aggression, war crimes, crimes against humanity. And the perpetrator will one day be brought to account. Otherwise, if we do not manage to do so, then it's just a matter of time that we come across one of them at our doorstep, someone who has been killing, looting, raping. Um, that means that no one can feel safe. We need to complete this process. No, it's, absolutely. The accountability is um, critical. Yes, Tommy, I'm sorry. Yeah, please. There's something else that Russia is doing in Ukraine, which is quite shocking. It is abducting Ukrainian children and bringing them to Russia and have them adopted by Russian parents, you know, to bring them up as, as Russian. I think this is such a horrible thing to do. It's clearly a violation of international law. So, you know, this is another example of the, the totally ruthless and brutal manner in which this war is being conducted, you know, and, and and they should be held to account. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we need strong accountability mechanisms. And I agree with ambassadors. I think unfortunately the process is slow and we know from experience of the um, International Criminal Court, very, very costly and the output maybe not necessarily in um, the same uh, uh, balance as that uh, the cost that goes in, but nonetheless, and I understand, I've heard, of course, that Ukraine has been very methodical, that despite this war, they're preparing uh, for the future accountability. So which leads me um, to, um, let's look now a little bit to the future as well. Um, and I know we have some questions from the audience that we might want to get to, but where are we a year from now? What are, you know, what are the steps that need to be taken, that will be taken? Um, I know there's a lot of emphasis and I agree, you know, Ukraine is asking for armaments, there's sanctions. Um, so how do, how do you see the, uh, hopefully in a year we'll be celebrating actually. <laughs> I hope that will be our next webinar in a year, definitely is, is that. But um, where, where do we go from here? Well, the short term scenario is to drive Russian troops out of our territory, to liberate all temporarily occupied territories of Ukraine to the line of uh, 1991. No territorial concessions can be acceptable, not because we are a nation of the warmongers, but because um, it will one day become a, a tinderbox that will explode again. Not a single inch of Ukrainian land should remain under Russian control. That's what we know and what we see after so many um, war crimes committed by the Russian Federation, not only against Ukraine. In fact, 
And I think this is the bottom line here. Putin has never paid a substantial economic and political pri price for his crimes, for the land grabs in Georgia and then Crimea and then parts of Donbass, for uh, the murders in and outside Russia, for war crimes in Syria, and many other cases that we all have faced. And I think that is something we need to think about when we speak about the possible victory scenario for Ukraine. So the main thing is, of course, to, to uh, push Russia out of Ukraine. This is a very difficult task, as we are still dealing with uh, quite a formidable enemy. This is a big country. They are ready to throw as much cannon fodder as is needed to make a difference. Anyway, they do not achieve a lot of progress. It took uh, Russia's armed forces six or seven months to conquer a smaller town with a population of 10,000 people. But still, we realize that um, we need more weapons, more wide range uh, equipment to be able to turn the tide of the war. Because going into counteroffensive is always much more difficult than to defend your territories from the aggressor who just um, put his foot on your soil. So that's what we are working at. And um, I think we need to focus on that. But again, this is a process that is quite a complex one. So you need support. You need that economy works. You need that... Um, the civil, the civil population of the country does not suffer, that people can still uh, perform their daily activities uh, and um, run their business. Uh, by the way, it was a very clear example of that. If you now visit Ukraine and go down the street, you hear a lot of noise of, of the, from the generators that are walking in front of every shop, in front of every pharmacy, every shopping mall. This is the only way for the SMEs in Ukraine to keep running their business. And these are important taxpayers who also make their contributions into that victory. So this is something that needs to, to run swiftly. And we are working on that with our international partners. And we are grateful to many of them who have committed um, their um, economic assistance, financial um, aid to Ukraine. Um, and of course, there are other elements that I have already focused on, but once again, I think it is critical to understand that the more businesses leave Russia, the more companies make a decision to cut off business ties with the Russian Federation, the weaker Russia is getting. A very important point, circumvention of sanctions. It is uh, critical to keep it in the loop that Russia does not find any gray zones or any other options <laughs> to circumvent sanctions and to keep doing business as usual. These are all the elements that we need. And of course, we need to work on the ground with the international humanitarian organizations. A very big deal is now the demining of Ukraine's territories as one third of our territory has been mined. Uh, and of course, to allow Ukraine to go back to the same amounts of food deliveries that we used to deliver. Despite the war, we were able to deliver more than 50 million tons of agricultural products last year. Uh, this year, this process has a bit uh, slowed down. Uh, the reason is um, the delays with ins inspections on the vessels that have been artificially imposed by the Russian authorities which of course um, causes um, huge problems for, for the companies willing to uh, deliver food products to the most vulnerable societies of the world. So we always have to um, keep the broader picture in mind and not to look at it just like um, getting a victory uh, and celebrating it uh, on the very next day. No, this is a long process that will take uh, quite a long for us to come to some certain point where we see that the war is over. Now we can keep living as we used to prior to that invasion. Well, I hope, I definitely, I think everyone is hoping for that. 
Um, Tommy, you have some comment. Uh, I think the people of the world would like to see an end to this conflict. I think the people of the world would like to see Ukraine and Russia come to a negotiating table and come to a negotiated settlement. The UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, was asked recently whether there are any prospects of peace talks. And he said, not for the time being. I think he's right. I, think, I don't think President Putin is ready to make peace with Ukraine. I think he remains convinced that his forces will prevail in the battlefield. I think at the moment, I don't think he's willing to withdraw from Crimea or the four regions in the east that he, he's occupying and wish to incorporate into Russian territory. So the moment is not right. When the moment is right, I hope the UN Secretary General will seize the moment and convene peace talks between Ukraine and Russia. As for sanctions, as for sanctions, sanctions will only work if they are universal. <clears throat> and if there are no leakages. In the case of Russia, there, there are several big leakages. Mm -hmm. You know, China is a leakage, India is a leakage, and even Saudi Arabia and some other countries are buying Russian oil and gas. So if not, it will be very difficult to make the sanctions hurt because of all these leakages. Yeah. So I hope a year from now, the second anniversary, there will be peace, but uh, I'm not optimistic. Yeah, thank you. Um, and we do have some questions, so I think I probably should get to those. Um, and one is uh, in relation to this idea, of, um, uh, as you said, sitting at the negotiating table. I have to say, I recall that recently President Macron uh, made the statement that Russia should be defeated but not crushed. Um, what does that mean exactly? Um, and I know that there seems to be some who think that, well, in order to bring peace, Ukraine perhaps should, you know, um, be willing to negotiate on Crimea. Um, so anyway, but there is a question. So, and you can also answer that, but here we have from um, um, Sahib Marikar. Thank you for your question. And it is mediation is part of the alternative disputes resolution process to ensure both parties' communication with a neutral, respected, high regard. Um, can mediation initiative help? Um, so I think, again, it, it kind of follows up on the Tommy's points of negotiation. My, my short answer is that uh, the time is not right for mediation. The gap between the two sides is too great. And I don't see President Putin as being ready to talk peace to Ukraine. In the current situation, I agree with Antonio Guterres that the moment is not right for peace talks. Yeah, uh -huh. Ambassador. Naturally, all wars inevitably end at the negotiation table and uh, one day we will be there. But I think Professor is absolutely right. To negotiate on something, we need substance. And mediation could help but we need substance. We need uh, a subject to talk about. Now we are at absolutely different parts of the barricades and we are in the conventional war. Uh, if you remember the time that limbo period prior to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, end of 2021, the beginning of 2022, how many diplomatic forays took place? Exactly. How many attempts had been made in order to, 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 to convince Russia not to start this all-out invasion of Ukraine? They all failed because he has chosen the, the, peace, the path of war. And we are still there. For Putin, any concessions, any defeats, and lack of, as well as lack of victory, uh, on the ground in Ukraine 
is extremely dangerous because it poses a direct threat to his own future as a, as a dictator and his regime. So he will not step back. He will keep fighting uh, and will be ready to pay any price for that. For Ukraine, I think not a single country is more interested than Ukraine in a short war. We are not interested in a protracted conflict on our soil. We keep losing our people. We keep losing our critical infrastructure. Um, and uh, this is quite a, yeah, quite a tragedy what we are going through now. But see this past in parabellum, if you want peace, prepare yourself for the war. We are now in the stage of the war. Ambassador Zelenko, uh, I agree. Um, I think yes, in the ideal world mediation, but I recall I was in Geneva at the time, the great summit between President Biden and, um, and Putin um, in Geneva, uh, nothing happened. Um, so uh, I don't know. Um, unfortunately, again, going back to Macron's statement that Russia should not be crushed, you know, but what about Putin? Is, is Russia Putin? I mean, anyway, I should, I can go on and I won't, but I, we do have a question I think here is from Suhei Li, I hope I said it correctly. And again, going back to Nilo, because I think this is really important to make this really clear. Um, the question is this, if we agree to reject Macron's influence, as Ambassador Zelenko has mentioned, how should our attitude be towards the expansion of NATO, which is widely regarded as a zone of military and political influence by the United States? Again, I just think there's a real misunderstanding of NATO, but um, I leave, so please go ahead, Tommy, Ambassador Zelenko, uh, this whole NATO issue, I feel, is uh, um, is so uh, misunderstood because even if NATO does expand, that's not a that's not a justification for war. Frankly, Ukraine is an independent state. There was the we haven't talked. And let's talk a little bit about that, Ambassador Zelenko. But the Belazova Accord, I think that needs to be highlighted. So please go ahead. Yeah, I think. Uh... Uh, in his attempts to avoid the expansion of NATO, Putin achieved quite an opposite. Now we see Finland and Sweden looking forward to their NATO membership. So the history showcases that the best way for uh, to stop the process of NATO expansion is for Russia to stop its aggression. If there is no threat, there will be no willingness to, to think about the, your security and safety. And it was uh, uh, absolutely correct when Professor Ko mentioned it uh, at the very beginning, saying that that was exactly the reason why the Baltic states, as one of the first steps after they gained their independence, started working on their um, integration into the Euro-Atlantic community. Because this is the only one way to have kind of security guarantees. It is, by the way, a very interesting and a very complex topic to speak about security guarantees. I am frequently asked about it. What kind of security guarantees does Ukraine want to, to have? NATO membership? Yes, it could be a good security guarantee, but this is a matter of time. Uh, getting back nuclear weapons? Yes, but this is not possible. We have to get real. What kind of security guarantees we can have? I think this is a complex of steps and it was actually enshrined very well in the peace formula by the President Zelensky that he presented uh, during the G20 summit end of last year. Um, that includes 10 different principles and pillars that could give peace a chance. We speak about sustainable and, and, and uh, just and, and lasting peace. Um, these elements include uh, nuclear safety uh, and food security, justice, uh, exchange of prisoners, many elements fulfilling which we will come closer to, to a quite a robust security system in Europe, which will allow us to move forward on the path of peace. But this is still this is a matter of time. Now we are still in 
in the phase where we first have to liberate our territories, not only to withstand uh, this aggression, but also to uh, move forward liberating more and more regions of Ukraine. Yeah, thank you. And, and Tommy as well, I mean, uh, looking at the this whole issue of NATO expansion, you talked about that, you also in your um, op-ed, um, uh, and, and I agree with, in fact, it's with Ambassador Zelenkos had the, the uh, effect of actually provoking uh, NATO expansion because of Sweden and Finland. But even so, is that a reason for uh, Russia to invade Ukraine? Ukraine wasn't even a candidate yet to NATO. I mean, the, 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 the reality is different. I think that's the problem. What's it's the reality an, of NATO? It, it's an excuse. It's an excuse for the Russian to invade Ukraine to say the expansion of NATO poses a threat to Russia. Therefore, to protect ourselves, we must, we must counter this threat. And to counter the threat, we must invade Ukraine. It, it's a phony argument. What is driving NATO's expansion is Russia. <laughs> if Russia is not seen as a threat, the countries in Europe wouldn't be queuing up to join NATO. Why are Finland and Sweden which have traditionally been neutral country, asking to join NATO because they feel threatened by, by Russia, you know? So this is a phony argument. And I'm sorry to say that my, my friend, Professor Mia Scheimer, is the first person to propagate this phony argument. And because of its reputation as a scholar, a lot of people have uh, latched on to his argument. And, and now blame NATO is a very common refrain, you know? But this is wrong. This is wrong. The fault doesn't lie in NATO. The fault lies in Moscow. And what is driving NATO expansion is Russia itself. Indeed. And, and again, truth is so important. There's a lot of false news out there. And this narrative, unfortunately, is taking hold with some people, this NATO expansion, because in truth, NATO had instituted a partnership for peace with Russia. <laughs> it was Putin that was rejecting NATO's. Uh, so I think that uh, we really, that's why I think history is important. The Belazova Accords, very important. Russia had recognized Ukrainian independence. No one forced Russia. And the, uh, the 1994 Budapest security assurance exactly when ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons and may, and in retrospect maybe that was a mistake because <laughs> ukraine a nuclear weapon i don't think putin dares to invade ukraine it received the guarantee of three major powers russia the united states united kingdom and it is it is shocking that one of the guarantor power should itself be the aggressor you know so I, in my op-ed, I talk about Russia's broken premises, promises. Yeah, and you know, interestingly, I still remember, you can also find it on YouTube videos with, with some statements delivered by Putin's spokesperson, Putin himself, uh, dated by 2012, 2013, where they clearly say Crimea is Ukraine. One year later, Crimea has been occupied. So there is no trust in the words of uh, the Russian political leadership. And we always have to stay vigilant because we really see and hear a lot of false facts and disinformation that can sometimes be misleading. So that's why I always speak that about the need to double check the fact and we all need to preserve the critical thinking. It's very important to achieve progress. It, it is. The uh, facts are so important, the correct facts, the true, true facts. So I have your question, and I know we're at four, but I hope you'll indulge. We can go a little bit over time, um, uh, because I think it is an important question as well, again, from Sui Li. So comparable in the attitude shown by Laos and Vietnam, as mentioned by Prof Ko, India and China have not shown the same decisive stance supporting Ukraine against the Russian invasion as Singapore and the US. 
But India and China alone account for one third of the world's population. So how should we address this issue, at least nominally within the framework of UN country representation? A significant portion of humanity has not taken a clear stance as Singapore and the US. So again, India and China, very important. I think I will just give a very short answer. You know, the UN Charter does not differentiate between big or small states between nuclear and non-nuclear powers. Every nation has its voice, has its right to vote, and is a full-fledged member of the organization. No matter how big it is, and no matter how um, influential is this um, country. Of course, China and India are uh, global players, very important. Um, actors on the international arena and they could use their leverage and their influence to contribute significantly to uh, bring in peace closer. I hope that we will have more opportunities and more possibilities for dialogue to find the common ground and to exchange views and to seek the ways how to do it. That is something that is critical because again the war in Ukraine is not only about Ukraine. Yeah. Um, Oops, Tommy. <laughs> I, I must uh, watch my words. <laughs> um, so let me take those two countries one at a time, China. From the Chinese point of view, the most important adversary in the world is the United States. And this rivalry between China and the United States is getting worse rather than getting better. China need allies to confront the United States. And for China, Russia is an important ally. Just before Russia invaded Ukraine, the two countries concluded a so-called partnership with no limits. Basically, what they are saying is that in the context of the current world situation, we, China and Russia, seek common cause because we have a common enemy, the United States of America. This is the logic of this no limit partnership between China and Russia. This is number one priority. And in view of this, there's no way in which China can criticize Russia. So, so that's China. In the case of India, it's slightly different, but history is always important. And you should remember that during the Cold War, India and the Soviet Union were allies. And even now, Russia is important to India as a major arms supplier, as a seller of oil and gas to India. India is an energy dependent country. And also India wants to play a foreign policy of non-alignment. On some issues, it will be with the United States. So in opposing China, it is with the United States. It's a member of Quad. On other issues, it will be with Russia. And on still other issues, it will be with Australia and Japan. So, so this is a game India is playing. It, it doesn't want to be aligned to any great power. It wants to be an independent country. And depending on the specific issue, it could be in a coalition with, with United States, or it could be a coalition with Russia or it could be a coalition with some other country. So there's no way in which India will condemn Russia because it is not in India national interest to do so. You know? So no amount of dialogue between uh, Ukraine and India will persuade India to move because India's position is based upon India's perception of its national interest. 
Thank you, Tommy. And, and I think you, you always bring in the important historical context as well. And I guess it is significant, at least, that India has abstained and not voted against um, the resolutions so, so far. One more question. Do we have time for one more question? Yes? Okay. Um, because again, I think this is important in the sense that uh, is this part of the uh, fake news being generated? Um, and this is a question um, that Sama Olivine notes that in several online forums, it seems to be taken for granted that the ideal way in which to ensure Ukraine and the Baltic states' long-term security is for the Russian Federation to be disintegrated into its component republics. Is such a move likely to stabilize the region as many appear to believe, or is this more keyboard warrior fantasy? You see, I mean, it's, it's part of this whole conspiracy theory going on that detracts from the truth. Russia invi invaded Ukraine, that's it. Anyway, I'm the moderator. I shouldn't say this, but go ahead, <laughs> comment. <laughs> I will let Ambassador Zelenko answer this question. Okay, Ambassador Zelenko. The neighbor of Russia and understand Russia better than I do. You know, this is a quite a complex question. Who can stop Putin? This is Russian people that can stop Putin. Uh, can we expect Russians to stop Putin in the nearest future? I don't think so. There are many conspiracy theories that we can debunk and it will take uh, longer to focus on that. The only one fact is that we, of course, now at this critical juncture of the war, need to think about the time after. What's gonna happen after the war is over, after Ukraine, I'm sure, prevails? What will be happening to our neighbor that still will be there? Russia will always be our neighbor, quite an aggressive one with lots of revanchist sentiments, I'm sure, and we will have to deal with that. In diplomacy and in the theory of international relations, there is a very important uh, term, deterrence. We need to think about the robust mechanism of deterrence so that in the future the Kremlin thinks twice before it starts and launches its aggression against its neighboring countries. Another thing that I, this is my personal view, I truly believe that a very good way to keep Russia weakened enough is to strengthen and to support Russia's immediate neighbors. Those Countries that really play by the rules, I now do not speak about Belarus. This is an exception. But the stronger neighbors of Russia are the better for them, because then we realize that um, the regime in Russia, I do not know if there will be a regime after that. We cannot really hope that after Putin retires or just uh, leaves power, there will be immediate change of the concept of power in Russia. However, I think it is just important to make sure that such terrible crimes of aggression never happen again. And now this is about us, diplomats, politicians, to find such ways. This is a very difficult task as we are dealing with the one who does not understand the language of diplomacy while the speaker time about uh, negotiations and peace process, but keep killing our people and raping our children at the same time. Um, it is quite difficult to find a common ground and to find a very effective recipe, but we have to. Otherwise, the European and global security will remain being a threat. Thank you, Ambassador. T Tommy? Uh, no, there's nothing to add. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, indeed, um, this is Russia's war. 
Russia waged it. It started in 2014. I think we really have to underline this point. Uh, this is not just a year ago. Unfortunately, unfortunately, and I think this is uh, Ambassador Zelenko made clear, Putin has not paid a price for that. Uh, and this is where perhaps the international system did fail originally. Um, would Putin have uh, <laughs> invaded Ukraine a year ago had the international community really taken a strong stance, stronger um, in 2014? What that could have been is another issue. Um, but again, um, we're coming to an end. I know there's a question, but I don't think it's a question that the ambassador really should be asked. I don't think Ukraine is going to concede anything but you know, for peace, you know, I think that um, I have a problem with the idea that those who wage a uh, wrongful war should somehow or another benefit in any way from that. That's a bit real politique, maybe those who think otherwise. Um, so um, let us hope that the, the, the international system will work to ensure that the Russian, um, uh, uh, this Russian violation of international law at its worst, frankly. I mean, there is no provocation. NATO did not provoke this. I really, you know, stand in strong disagreement. Ukraine was an independent uh, state that had been recognized by Russia. Um, so having said that, um, you know, what are, what, where do we go from here? Um, I think we've had a really good discussion uh, today with uh, Ambassador Zelenko and of course Tommy Ko, who brings you know uh, great insight and experience. I think I should have asked you a little bit more of your experience from when you were a special envoy, but maybe we'll have to do part two to this and continue um, because this is one of the most pressing issues right now the world is facing. Ambassador Zelenko, I agree with you. This is not a regional issue. You know, it's about peace in the world and accountability. Uh, and unfortunately, the international system uh, is, is grappling with this. So we still have a ways to go. But I wanna thank all our uh, uh, the people who have joined us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your questions. Um, and I know we can talk a lot more and we will in the future. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you, Ambassador Zelenko. Thank Let's you. hope next year we'll come with better news. So, Take care. I'll hope for that. Thank you. All the best.